we gather on the homeland of the Pascuosa, where they lived for generations upon generations and were the stewards of this land. The Pascuosa people still live here. Under the 1855 Yakima Treaty and the Session Agreement of 1893, the Pascuosa retained 36 square miles of this homeland on which their traditional hunting, fishing, and gathering rights were guaranteed. For almost two centuries, the United States government has broken its treaty obligations. The rights of the Pascuoso were stolen by the government through fraudulent surveys, indifference, and intentional violations. Much of the Pascuoso land was transferred to colonists and corporations. None of the remaining land was preserved for the Pascuoso. Hunting, fishing, and gathering rights were denied. In 2010, the fishing rights of the Pascuoso were finally confirmed through litigation. The government still refuses to acknowledge their land rights. The Pascuosa continue their traditions and seek to have all their rights recognized. Good morning and welcome to Cascade Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. I'm your guest preacher today. I'm Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford, or as the folks at the church I serve call me, Rev Joe. It is great to be together today to take one day out of the week where we get to be reminded of what we value and where we get to share in a common worship experience. It is tradition in Unitarian Universalist congregations to light a chalice at the beginning of our services. And this goes back to the time of the Holocaust when courageous Unitarians set up the Unitarian Service Committee in Europe to try and help those uh, who were trapped by Nazis to get out. And sometimes the way that we use our courage comes in very practical ways. What they needed is they needed a lot of paperwork to try and get people out. And on that paperwork, they needed something that looked official. And so they commissioned an artist, Hans Deutsch, to create a symbol for their faith. And so Hans created the uh, symbol of the flaming chalice. So this many years later, now we actually light a real chalice and it stands as a beacon for all those who need help. Let us light our chalice now with these collective words. Please join with me. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. May this chalice flame remind us to encourage each other and to take courage from our theological forebears upon whose shoulders we rise. Please raise your voices and spirit in our opening hymn, We Laugh, We Cry led by the Live Oak UU Choir. Just to have some time alone. 
From the Gifts of Imperfection by Benet Brown. Courage is a huge theme in my life. It seems that either I'm praying for some, feeling grateful for having found a little bit, appreciating it in other people, or studying it. I don't think that makes me unique. Everyone wants to be brave. The root of the word courage is core, the Latin word for heart. In one of its earliest forms, the word courage had a very different definition than it does today. Courage originally meant to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. Over time, this definition definition has changed, and today, Courage is more synonymous with being heroic. Heroics is important, and we certainly need heroes, but I think we've lost touch with the idea that speaking, speaking honestly and openly about who we are, about what we're feeling, and about our experiences, good and bad, is the definition of courage. Heroics is often about putting our life on the line. Ordinary courage is about putting our vulnerability on the line. In today's world, that's pretty extraordinary. And courage has a ripple effect. Every time we choose courage, we make everyone around us a little better and the world a little braver. Over the last couple of years, we've heard a lot of ridiculous things, but I think for me, the thing that I have found just the most ridiculous, so much so that I, I, I become speechless when I hear it or read it, is the idea that to exhibit any kind of healthy caution is to be afraid, is to be a coward. How often have you seen or maybe even heard someone say that they aren't going to social distance, they aren't going to wear a mask, because they are not going to live a life of fear. <laughs> it's ridiculous, and we know it's ridiculous, and there's like so many different examples and questions we can give, like, oh, okay, does that mean that, you know, you're not going to wear a seatbelt when you drive because you're not going to live in fear? It, let's call it what it is, it's ridiculous. But this whole question of courage, and is there a common understanding of it? Is courage, in fact, a virtue that we should strive toward? I think that's one that we should dig into. Doing something recklessly is not necessarily courage, right? If you uh, admire a bully and the bully eggs you on to do something dangerous, like say, try to take over the Capitol and stop the election proceedings, I don't describe that as courage. I think most of us are in agreement of the, the whole idea that courage does not mean an absence of fear. It means that you can feel the fear and yet move forward, take action anyway. But for courage to be a virtue, I think there has to be something involving a greater purpose, uh, involving ethics. I think that for courage to truly exist in our actions, we have to be operating from our own guiding principles based on the ethical precepts that we have chosen for ourselves. Apparently, there has been a bit of a kerfluffle lately about how Dr. Seuss Enterprises made the decision that six of his books, they are no longer going to submit for printing. 
There has been some shock around this. Apparently, some people are just now getting the memo that uh, Theodore Geisel was kind of racist in some ways. Well, fans of Unitarian John Haynes Holmes, we're sitting back and we're going, we could have told you this and a long time ago. John Haynes Holmes was a Unitarian minister who lived from 1879 to 1964, and he was just an extraordinary man when you look at everything that he accomplished in his life. He was one of the co-founders um, with his friend W.E.B. Du Bois of the NAACP. He was a co-founder of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. He started the Unitarian Fellowship of Social Justice, and he was an admirer, a follower, really, of Gandhi before most people even knew that he existed. In 1921, he preached a sermon about Gandhi titled, The Greatest Man Alive Today, which was, at that time, Gandhi was relatively unknown. Gandhi was a significant influence in Holmes's life. And Holmes was a pacifist and would be a pacifist for all of his life. It is one thing to be a pacifist in times of peace. At that point, it's merely kind of a philosophical, theoretical thing. But during wartime, it can be very difficult. On April 3rd, 1917, John Haynes Holmes preached the sermon, A Statement to My People on the Eve of War, in which he laid out his pacifist guiding principles. In his sermon, he said, When hostilities begin, it is universally assumed that there is but a single service which a loyal citizen can render to the state, that of bearing arms and killing the enemy. Will you understand me if I say humbly and regretfully that this I cannot and will not do? When, therefore, there comes a call for volunteers, I shall have to refuse to heed. When there is an enrollment of citizens for military purposes, I shall have to refuse to register. When or if the system of conscription is adopted, I shall have to decline to serve. If this means a fine, I will pay my fine. If this means imprisonment, I shall serve my term. If this means persecution, I will carry my cross. No order of president or governor, no law of nation or state, no loss of reputation, freedom, or life will persuade me or force me to do this business of killing. On this issue, for me at least, there is no compromise. Mistaken, foolish, fanatical I may be, I will not deny the charge, but false to my own soul I will not be. The United States entered World War I three days later. Haynes preached this sermon stating that he knew and accepted that there could be consequences and that he would face them. And there were. In 1917, to say that you were a pacifist meant to face public opinion that would say that you were not only a coward, you were a traitor. And it wasn't just public opinion. His own denomination turned on him viciously. In one of the missteps in our history, they allowed no right of conscience where war was concerned. The magazine of the AUA, the American Unitarian Association, characterized any opposition to the war as treason. And the president of the AUA, Samuel Elliott, said that any minister who opposed the war, who did not support the war, should be dismissed from their job. And in 1918, 
the AUA board decided to deny any financial assistance to any church that had a minister who is not a willing, earnest, and outspoken supporter of the United States in a vigorous and resolute prosecution of the war. Nevertheless, Holmes was a committed pacifist his entire life. In 1942, during World War II, Dr. Seuss wrote an editorial cartoon savaging Holmes for his pacifism. I have cropped out the racist imagery of a Japanese soldier. And when people wrote to the newspapers complaining of the comic, Dr. Seuss doubled down, writing, in response to the letters defending John Haynes Holmes, sure, I believe in love, brotherhood, and a cooing white pigeon on every man's roof. I even think it's nice to have pacifist and strawberry festivals in between wars. But right now, when the Japs are planting their hatchets in our skulls, it seems like a hell of a time for us to smile and warble brothers. It is a rather flabby battle cry. If we want to win, we've got to kill Japs, whether it depresses John Haynes Holmes or not. We can get palsy-wowsy afterward with those that are left. To be hopeless would seem so strange. It dishonors those who go before us. So lift me up to the light of change. There is a in my. Across the nation, and there is wailing the whole world round. But I am open, and I am willing, for to be hopeless would seem so strange. It is on those who go. Before us, so lift me.
It dishonors those who go before us. So lift me up to the light of The church that John Haynes Holmes served, which is now known as Community Church of New York, did not agree with his pacifism, but they had guiding principles that they followed. And one of their guiding principles was about freedom of conscience, and the other was about freedom of the pulpit. And so to that end, they kept him on and supported him. They lost 15 members because of that. But over the next year, they gained 208. And as for the American Unitarian Association, in 1936, they repudiated their own 1918 decision. They returned to the core religious values of Unitarianism. And during World War II, they supported conscientious objectors. And they went back to their fundamental principles about freedom of thought and conscience. Courage can also mean saying, we were wrong. We're going to do better. This is not a sermon about pacifism. I myself do not consider myself to be one. I believe to a certain extent in the just war theory. But I admire Holmes for being willing to state what he believed and live that out and take the consequences as they came. What does courage mean for you? right now in your life. I believe that courage as a virtue requires us to individually identify our core values and decide on the principles that come out of those values that we will allow to guide our lives even when it is neither convenient nor easy. We are all wired in different ways, and we all respond to anxiety in different ways. Uh, what might take tremendous courage for one person is easy to another. Nowadays, I find that often courage is being willing to face uh, embarrassment or feeling awkward being able to say something even before you have it perfectly lined out to where no one could possibly argue with you. For me, it doesn't take a lot of courage for me to be able to stand up to those that I guess you could call my enemies. I don't really think like that, but, but people who absolutely have very different values than I do and who I would be willing uh, to fight for justice. You know, someone who, <laughs> well, someone who believes that wearing a mask is foolish or a sign of fear and has no compassion for anyone else who might get sick. Uh, someone who doesn't believe that systemic racism exists. Someone who doesn't believe that a woman should be a preacher. Like to, to, to uh, argue or to stand up against someone like that doesn't take any courage from me. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. I have to check myself and make sure of my motivations, right? Am I speaking against this person because it is the right thing to do within my guiding principles? 
Am I using my best thinking to make this decision or is this actually coming out of my feelings and that delicious feeling of self-righteousness or worse yet, the feeling of pleasure at being able to hurt another person, no matter how justified I am, if my motivation is to hurt or to feel better about myself, I need to stop right then and sit down and engage my thinking rather than my feelings. It's been said that it can take real courage to stand up to your friends. But you know, when I think about it, when I think about my close friends, that doesn't take a lot of courage. And maybe it's just because I'm really lucky. I have friends who will absolutely tell me when they think that I am wrong about something. I don't have to guess. I don't have to be tentative in my opinions. I know that they care for me and have a trust in me that they will do that that gift for me. And I don't have to feel that anything that I say to them, you know, boom, that's just going to be the end of the relationship. For me, where I have to use some courage is between those two extremes, between the extremes of the people I'm close to, who I know are going to care for me, even in spite of myself and the people who most likely are never going to change their opinion of me no matter what I say or do. It's that middle area, that fragile area of public opinion of people who don't know me well enough and we don't have a invested relationship that would make them want to say something to me if I'm wrong and hang around and, and try to stay connected. <sighs> yeah, that's where I have to use my courage. And this is where differentiation of self really is the key. To be able to know what my core values are and act or speak out of my guiding principles knowing and accepting that there can be consequences. And the consequences may not be so dramatic as what John Haynes Holmes had to go through. It could simply be that someone who I kind of like or kind of admire is suddenly going to unfriend me on Facebook and that'll be the end of any potential relationship there. Or that people who know me casually consider and consider me to be a friend that they could have a lesser opinion of me. Courage means relinquishing an attachment to what I can't control and controlling what I can, operating out of what I believe to be my best thinking and knowing that sometimes I will be misunderstood by others and that'll be a consequence. And sometimes I will be completely understood and I will be wrong. And accepting that that's part of life. That's part of growing. If I don't have the courage to say what is true for me, then that means that I am also giving up a whole lot of opportunity for growth because it may not be pleasant, but when we realize we are wrong, that is when we grow. But when we are clear about what is in that moment true for us, and we can say it perhaps with a trembling voice, but we can say it out loud, even if it feels like the entire rest of the world disagrees with us. 
then we can say to ourselves, as did Holmes in his sermon, false to my own soul, I will not be. But if you are lucky, as John Haynes Holmes was, to have people, to have a community around you who will support you and be there for you even if they disagree with you, hold them close and recommit and give and take courage from one another. As Wayne Arneson, my friend and colleague says, take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. Please raise your spirit and voice for our closing hymn, Courage, My Friend, led by the Live Oak UU Choir. Courage, Courage my, friend, my friend, you do not walk alone. We will, we will walk, with you, walk with you and sing your spirit home. Justice, Justice my Thank you for joining us this morning and a special thank you to everyone who helped put this service together, our musicians and our worship associates. And a special thank you to you too for being here. Your presence matters, especially during this time when we can't physically be together. May you go forward this week with strength and courage knowing that you are lovable and loved and you are not alone. Please join in our collective chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Raise your hands in the spirit of community as we sing our closing song. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again.